Well, thank you everybody for joining the Key Opinion Leader or KOL Day of Inhibicase Therapeutics. Today, we've got an excellent panel that's going to talk about the hows and whys of Parkinson's disease, the challenges for treatment and approval, and Inhibicase's efforts at finding a solution. Uh, just as a small disclaimer, uh, we are a public company listed on the NASDAQ under symbol IKT. There will be many forward-looking statements made by us and implied by many of our panelists today. And as such, you should be referring to our SEC filings for all the risks and potential uh, outcomes of our studies as we've previously made public. Uh, just as an agenda for today, we'll talk first uh, about the epidemiology of the disease and clinical features. Then we'll go on to talk about the time courses and stages of the disease, uh, current approaches to treatment and the inhibit case solution. And then we'll discuss managing Parkinson's disease, the unmet needs and challenges, and then get to an extended Q&A. We have a distinguished group of panelists today, Warner Poe, Professor Emeritus and past chair, Department of Neurology at the Medical University of Innsbruck in Austria. Uh, Bob Hauser, who is a professor of neurology and director of the Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorder Centers of Excellence at University of South Florida. Uh, Warren Olano, who is our interim CMO, the chief executive of ClinTech Research Corporation, a clinical research consultancy for movement disorders and uh, both past uh, professor and past chair of the Department of Neurology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and professor of the Department of Neuroscience at Mount Sinai, and then myself, president and CEO of Inhibicase Therapeutics. So uh, let me turn to um, the first of our um, presentations today by Werner Poe. Uh, Werner, go ahead. Thank you, Milton. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Werner Pöver. I'm a clinical neurologist and a movement disorder specialist. I served as the chair of the Department of Neurology of Innsbruck Medical University in Austria for the past 25 years, and I've devoted most of my career to research career to Parkinson's disease and movement disorders, in particular diagnosis, biomarkers, treatments, clinical trials, and it's my pleasure to give you a very brief introductory overview on the disease, on Parkinson's disease, in a couple of slides. So Milton, if I can have the next one, uh, just to remind everyone that Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease next to Alzheimer's disease, and it is the fastest growing neurological disorder, certainly the fastest growing neurodegenerative disease uh, um, we have. Currently, when the WHO last um, did their global burden of disease analysis in 2016, they estimated that there will be uh, that there are about 6.2 million people affected by Parkinson's disease globally, which was a 2.5-fold increase from their previous review uh, a generation earlier in 1990. And the projection is that Parkinson's disease incidence and prevalence will go up and double again over the next generation might reach something like 12 to 13 million. That has prompted, this development has prompted some of our colleagues to uh, call this uh, a Parkinson pandemic in this particular article. The slide you're looking at is taken from. Now, Parkinson's disease, one of the, we'll, we'll talk more about the underlying mechanisms of this illness, but Parkinson's disease uh, has a core abnormality in the brain that is related to um, loss of dopamine and dopamine cells um, in the brain, and that creates a number of perturbations in the motor circuits in those regulatory regions that govern our mobility and our ability to move uh, and perform voluntary and automated movements. So the, the key features, if I can have the next one, Milton, the key features of Parkinson's disease are movement abnormalities, motor features. And what is usually the first noticeable problem for people affected by the disease is a peculiar slowness and impairment of mobility. Neurologists call this bradykinesia. It's, it's a strange uh, inability to perform sequential movements in the right timing and pattern. Um, it's not weakness and it expresses itself in things like masked face with loss of, of uh, mimic expression, loss of dexterity in many 
everyday functions like handwriting or using a fork and knife or the computer keyboard, all these repetitive movements that we normally do without thinking about them don't quite uh, work and are not, not fluid. Uh, gait changes accordingly. People with Parkinson's feel a certain stiffness in their muscles as if they were too short. Sometimes they're painful. And one of the most obvious visible signs of the disease motor-wise is a peculiar trembling, uh, which James Parkinson, who first described this disease, called resting tremor. Uh, meaning that the trembling occurs in parts of the body, usually hands or feet, that are when they're not actively moved. And as the disease progresses, these motor problems become more severe and they can lead into very disabling uh, issues like uh, deformities of posture, not only a slight bending, but rose forward bending of the trunk. There can be deformities of the hands and feet, speech and speech swallowing become affected and very problematic um, and gait difficulties may become so bad that people will freeze on the spot or might even lose balance and fall. But that's not all uh, about the problems of Parkinson's disease patients. In the next slide you will see that there are a number of non-motor features of this illness as well. Um, they affect cognition, they affect uh, the, the um, initiative and energy one has. People with Parkinson's disease often appear to lose their drive and are apathetic. They may be depressed and as the disease progresses they may even become demented. There is oftentimes, particularly with advancing disease, problems of the autonomic nervous system with uh, blood pressure regulation problems, urinary and sexual dysfunction, sleep disorders, a whole list of disabilities. And that, I think, highlights why it is so difficult to treat Parkinson's disease. The next slide gives you an overview of what we can currently do in terms of drug treatment for this uh, illness. And it's very much focused on substituting with different drugs and agents the loss of dopamine in the brain. And that's very, very good and effective in terms of restoring mobility early in the disease in the first couple of years. But of course, it cannot address many of the later problems that occur and um, particularly dopamine replacement with this traditional drug levodopa leads into over years of treatment leads into peculiar um, what we call motor complications where people develop involuntary movements and you will hear a little bit more about it um, in, in a moment when, when Bob Hauser will later on go into these uh, problems. For treatment this means the next one that treatment as the disease progresses, you can have the next slide, Middleton, uh, treatment becomes more complex. And due to these deficiencies in the oral drugs we have for Parkinson's disease that produce these motor complications, particularly the classical core drug levodopa, um, we in advanced disease, patients are dependent on what we call device-aided therapies, where they may need infusion devices to guarantee um, motor control and a uh, pro proportion of patients even need deep brain surgery. And, and that really parallels the progression of Parkinson's disease as it evolves. And that's summarized on the next slide where you get a, a, a full view of how Parkinson's disease progresses over time from the very earliest stages. We're able now to identify what we call prodromal Parkinson's disease, early signs of illness, even disease risk prior to people developing any of the symptoms. Um, we're usually late when we make a clinical diagnosis based on the motor problems, um, but this is then called the early clinical stage. And as the disease progresses, and you will hear more about this, uh, uh, there are many, many complications that arise, response fluctuations to drugs where people switch on and off multiple times during a day, have these own involuntary movements and get other motor and non-motor problems. So to finish, the last slide I'm going to show you is just a list of 
the many or some of the many unmet needs and challenges we currently have in managing Parkinson's disease. One issue that I mentioned is the occurrence of these levodopa treatment related motor complications, but also the development of motor problems that are oftentimes resistant to whichever treatment we currently have. And they include these motor blocks with freezing of gait and falling and uh, severe problems in speaking and swallowing and these non-motor aspects of losing cognitive abilities up to the level of frank dementia, uh, failure of the autonomic nervous system and sleep disorders. And although we do have a number of drugs that can address some of these issues partially, the only solution for Parkinson's disease in the end will be to find ways to modify disease progression, to slow or stop disease progression. And that is the holy grail of all efforts currently in research uh, regarding treatment, new treatments for Parkinson's disease to identify agents that could modify the progression, the underlying mechanisms of Parkinson's disease. And with this, I'll hand it back uh, to Milton. Thank you. Great, thank you, Warner, for that insightful discussion of the disease characteristics. Let me invite uh, Warren Olano to join me, and uh, we'll talk next about the mechanism of what Inhibicase is doing, and then clinical progress, and what uh, what's going to happen next in the clinic for Inhibicase's effort. So, uh, just to remind you, um, I'm President and Chief Executive Officer of Inhibicase Therapeutics, and Warren Olano is our Interim Chief Medical Officer, but also is Chief Executive of Clintrex Research Corporation and a former professor and chair of the Department of Virology, a position he held for, I believe, more than 20 years at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. So just as a summary of many things that, for those of you who have seen our presentations in the past, we have taken a very different view of the disease course from based on the outcome of validated animal models, which reproduce human Parkinson's disease, both for the dependence on the misfolded protein linked to disease, a non-essential protein known as alpha-synuclein, and for the rate of progression of disease relative to lifespan. And so in a series of uh, animal studies, which were partly published at the beginning of this year, Movement Disorders, and in an upcoming publication at a major science journal a little bit later this quarter, what we've outlined is that a variety of events can give rise to uh, the formation of synuclein aggregates. We don't understand the linkage between genetic or biochemical events or environmental stresses that drive aggregate formation, but once aggregates form, it is possible that the disease can initiate. What you need is a certain threshold of this aggregate formation outside of the affected neurons in order to drive what happens within the affected neurons in the brain. As many of you know, both for Alzheimer's and for Parkinson's disease, the attack on aggregates has been the primary modality of treatment tried. There has been little or no clinical success and certainly no clinical success in doing so by trying to sequester or remove aggregates outside of the affected neurons and drive treatment benefit. What Inhibicase has uh, promoted in the last couple of years based on these validated animal models or where we could reproduce the disease is that we believe that the synuclein aggregates are necessary but not sufficient to cause disease. And what we believe happens is that these aggregates can be taken up passively or actively by the affected neurons. When they do, they stimulate the Abelson tyrosine kinase or C-ABL as we commonly refer to it. C able acts as a sentinel or surveillance mechanism for abnormality inside the affected neurons. And C able acts in, in a bipartite fashion on both the synuclein aggregates and other processes within these neurons to drive the disease. The primary effect is chemical modification of the synuclein aggregates themselves to create what we believe is the pathological form. We believe the pathological synuclein is moving between neurons through direct contact. There's been a lot of advances uh, recently highlighted at the uh, ADPD meeting in Barcelona this year about how transport between affected neurons can occur without exiting the affected neurons at all. Again, reinforcing the fact that antibodies do not seem to be able to gain access to the pathological form. The other act that happens is the inactivation of a protein known as Parkin, which plays a key role in mitochondrial function and biogenesis. Parkin also is related to clearance mechanisms such as the ubiquitin proteasome system. When ABL is activated, it not only modifies synuclein, it also inactivates Parkin. And therefore, if you're walking into the clinic to treat any existing patient, you've got to do, undo these two key events. Stop the production of what we believe to be the pathological species and drive reactivation of these clearance pathways 
with parkin and other proteins so that you could clear the synuclein aggregates themselves. We believe our lead agent, IKT1409, has shown very convincingly in progressive disease animal models to do both of these primary outcomes. So just to summarize from our perspective, internalization of misfolded or aggregated synuclein and the activation enable is a key response event to initiate and progress Parkinson's disease. The long sought goal of clearing synuclein aggregates, what we've been trying to do for the general class of misfolded protein diseases has been observed directly in response to treatment in Parkinson's disease animal models. And so that we get therapeutically driven clearance of aggregates within the affected neurons that drives functional recovery. And those uh, studies have been widely uh, disseminated by us and are now um, under consideration for full publication. Uh, we know that the reduction or clearance of these aggregates can drive restoration of endogenous processes that are, that are responsible for that. And when you clear the pathology and protect neurons, you get functional recovery. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Warren Olano, who's going to talk about our clinical studies to date and where we plan on going with them. Warren? Thank you, Milton. Uh, can you hear me all right? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Warren Olano, as you've heard. I've mostly been in academic uh, medicine for my career uh, and was chairman of neurology at Mount Sinai for almost 20 years. Uh, about 10 years ago, we formed Clintrex, uh, which has worked with uh, many, many companies in trying to develop uh, treatments for neurodegenerative disorders. And uh, this in turn has led to the approval of many uh, of these products, both uh, pills and devices. <clears throat> We're extremely excited about working with Milton on the uh, C-ABLE inhibitor because uh, from a basic science point of view, we think it has a, a great opportunity for interfering with activation of C-ABLE and the uh, toxic consequences and leading to the neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's disease. In order to do that, we have to fulfill certain requirements, specifically with respect to the FDA, but we're also sensitive to the requirements of the European and other agencies. <clears throat> to start with, we began with a SAD study or a single ascending dose study. Uh, in this trial, we looked at healthy controls. Uh, we looked at nine different cohorts, which were each comprised of eight patients, six active and two placebo. We tested single day dosing in doses of between 12.5 and 325 milligrams per day. And the important thing is even though this is a kinase inhibitor, uh, we uh, uh, found no problems with safety, tolerability, or pharmacokinetics, uh, which I'll comment on in just a moment. But the purpose of this ad study, of course, was to assess these factors. Next slide, please. We then went on to perform a multiple ascending dose study or a MAD trial. And here we looked at two different groups, which has become uh, somewhat routine in our, our approach. Uh, in the past, most uh, MAD studies were done in healthy controls. We think there's a lot to be learned by performing MAD studies in Parkinson patients as well. So what we do is start with some healthy controls, treat them for a period of time, in this case, seven days, uh, and then if all seems well, we move on and perform similar studies now using Parkinson's disease patients. And for this particular trial, uh, we looked at uh, two healthy controls uh, groups with testing doses of 12.5 and uh, 25 milligrams per dose. We then went on to look at Parkinson's disease cohorts and have so far looked at 50 and 100 milligrams and are planning to go ahead to look at 200 milligrams as well. Again, there are eight patients per cohort with six active. And again, the main endpoints are safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics. Uh, this time, though, because in the second half of the study, we're looking at Parkinson's disease patients, we look for some exploratory endpoints like UPDRS score and non-motor scores, et cetera. We don't really expect to see anything in such a short treatment period, but we do want to make sure that we're not seeing a worsening of Parkinson features. And you never know, maybe we will get lucky and see a signal of something positive happening. Next, please. So in the uh, phase one healthy control studies, uh, we saw no deaths, no serious adverse events, 
no clinically uh, significant adverse events. We did not uh, discover the maximal tolerated dose, and we found linearity of pharmacokinetics uh, up through 250 milligrams. Uh, in the Parkinson's disease patients, we similarly didn't see any significant adverse events. We did notice that exposure was a little bit less uh, than it is in the healthy controls, and that may have related to uh, factors such as absorption or other factors. But nonetheless, in the studies we've done, the, the, the disease, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, treatment was well tolerated and uh, did not lead to any clinically significant safety issues. Next, please. So the next thing we will do is now move on to uh, a proper uh, uh, double blind study. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know if there was a slide before this, Milton, but we're, we're, our next study is going to be a three month study in which we will look at a series of different doses and it's more a proof of concept study or a dose ranging study, if you will. And in this particular trial, we will follow patients randomized uh, to receive one of three doses uh, of active drug or placebo. There'll be about 40 patients per group and the patients will uh, be followed, as I said, for three months. Once again, we're looking for safety tolerability, and if we uh, determine that any one dose is better or worse uh, than the others. Uh, in addition, uh, now we have a better chance potentially of seeing uh, some uh, benefit related to Parkinson's disease or non-motor features, so we will look closely for those. And the main reason for doing this is not that we specifically expect to see a, uh, an anti-Parkinson effect or a slowing of progression effect uh, in this uh, short-term study, but we were hoping we can see signals which will inform our ability to move on to the next uh, trial, which is the one illustrated in this uh, particular uh, slide. It's also important to recognize that not only may a drug uh, such as the inhibicase uh, treatment, slow the rate of progression. But if it stops the uh, alpha-synuclein uh, uh, activation or the Parkin impairment, it may actually preserve neurons that might otherwise have degenerated and not just slow progression, but actually result in improvement. So it is not inconceivable that we would see something at three months and if we do, we don't want to miss it, but we're not anticipating we'll see it. The next study is a pivotal study. These are patients uh, who will now be uh, treated with whatever one or two doses we think are most uh, likely to be successful based on the proof of concept or dose ranging study. And this is a a study design that we have used repeatedly. It's a well-known route to uh, a treatment approval. Uh, and there is a tremendous natural history available on which, upon which we can uh, calculate sample sizes, et cetera. And our thinking here is that we are going to take untreated Parkinson patients. We will follow them for nine months and we will treat them with one or two doses of active treatment and or placebo, and we will use approximately 150 patients per group. The study will be designed to be pivotal. That is to say it will be randomized, it will be controlled. Uh, we will uh, use the appropriate analytical uh, methodologies and outcome measures will be assessed in a hierarchical, fa hierarchical fashion. The primary outcome measure we will use is UPDRS 2 plus 3, uh, that is to say the sum of motor and ADL scores. And that is because the agency has been somewhat reluctant to accept part three per se uh, as a primary endpoint, although that has not been unequivocally established. But nonetheless, uh, it seems that they want part two, which is more a measure of patient function. And so we will combine them in our primary outcome measures. We will of course also include measures of function we will look at measures of non-motoric uh, features, again, doing this in a hierarchical manner based on what we uh, potentially saw signals in in our previous study, 
And we will also look for biomarkers or indications of uh, uh, alpha-synuclein alteration based on changes that might be seen in plasma, CSF, or uh, skin. Um, the study will be designed in such a way that it will be considered to be uh, an adequate and well-controlled design and treatment, uh, assuming it's positive. And if we're lucky, the phase three study, uh, excuse me, the uh, earlier three month study could serve as a supportive measure and allow for consideration of approval based on these studies alone. We will also need to do long-term open label studies in order to establish safety. And traditionally what we will need is 300 patients treated for six months and 100 patients treated for 12 months with ideally at least half of them treated with the higher dose if we're looking at uh, more than one or two doses. And to facilitate recruitment into this uh, uh, open label study, patients who have participated in previous double blind studies will be eligible to be included as well as uh, new patients. Next, please. So I just wanted to make a few comments on the regulatory issues related to assessing a drug that we think has disease modifying effects. And here we run into a series of uh, issues. Uh, the main one being that no drug in neurology, let alone neurodegenerative disease, let alone Parkinson's disease, has ever been approved with an indication as being disease modifying. And no biomarker has been accepted as being a valid biomarker to serve as a primary endpoint in Parkinson's disease. The only design that the agency has ever indicated might be acceptable to reach this indication is what's called the delayed start study. And very briefly, what this means is patients are randomized to early treatment with placebo or active drug, and then delayed treatment after a period of time uh, in which all patients are treated with active treatment. And the idea is that if at the end of a satisfactory period of time, the two groups remain separated and the early group looks like it has a benefit that the delayed group does not achieve, even though they're on the same drug. And there is no evidence that the two groups are coming together, that might be acceptable uh, for being approved as a disease modifying therapy. In fact, as you can see in this slide, we performed such a study called the Adagio study. We published it in New England Journal a number of years ago. And uh, indeed it met three primary endpoints for the one milligram dose. Nonetheless, there were so many issues to be resolved, such as the margins for the non-inferiority alignment, whether in fact the disease was progressing in a linear fashion, that after considerable discussion, the agency did not accept this for reasons of approval for an indication. So one of the problems, if you want to go for a disease modifying indication, is right now there's only one trial design the agency has said would be acceptable. This is a long study, it's an expensive study, and even if it's positive, as in Adagio, there's no assurance that there won't be other issues that come up that prevent it being accepted as disease modifying. Next, please. So um, in my final slide, what I'd like to do is explain to you why we've chosen the design that we have. The study design we're using now is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group design. This is a standard approach. It's routinely employed. It's been the basis of approval for virtually all treatments in Parkinson's disease, and it's a well-accepted approach by the regulatory authorities. The problem is that you get an indication with this design that your therapy is a treatment for Parkinson's disease. It does not give you an indication for disease modifying. We have been working hard to try and address this issue. And at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a publication that uh, I wrote along with Carl Kieberts and Rusty Katz, who used to be head of the uh, neurology division at the FDA, in which we discuss how we can use this approach to accomplish the same goals as a disease modifying indication. So one of the things we can do now 
is we can describe the relevant basic science studies in section 12 of the label. And we can describe the clinical findings in section 14 of the label. And once it's in the label, even if it's not in the indication, then that information can be communicated for education and commercial purposes. In other words, physicians and patients can be informed about this and it can serve as the basis for discussion. So for example, in the case of Inhibicase, we potentially could, if the studies are positive and the drug is approved as an indication, with an indication as a treatment for Parkinson's disease, we could explain that this drug clears alpha-synuclein, that in relevant animal models, this has behavioral and pathological benefits, and that in clinical trials, not only does it improve UPDRS scores, but assuming that the results are positive, you might be able to say that it can provide benefits that are not seen with other agents such, or available agents, such as preventing falling, preventing cognitive decline, other kinds of things you might accept uh, or expect from a disease-modifying therapy. Thus, the clinician would be aware of the relevant pathological and basic science benefits. They would be able to be informed about all of the clinical benefits, and then they could make the judgment as to how they wanted to use this uh, drug and whether they considered this to be uh, disease-modifying. So that's a brief summary of the development program that we have put together uh, at, at uh, Inhibicase and uh, how we intend to approach a drug that we think has the potential to be disease modifying. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Warren, appreciate that. Um, just wanna remind everybody that there is a, a question and answer um, portal that you can see below the video player on your window. So for anybody who wants to ask a question, uh, we're developing the queue for that uh, as we move forward. Let me next introduce Bob Hauser from the University of South Florida to talk about why we need to find a path to slow disease progression. Bob? Well, thanks, Milton. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Dr. Bob Hauser. I'm director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center at the University of South Florida. Um, I do spend most of my time involved in patient care as well as uh, clinical trials. Next slide, please. So I'm going to build on Werner's talk and try and fill in some of the details as to what happens to patients over time and really try to communicate just how devastating uh, this disease is for patients. So when I see a patient in the office and I make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, the patient will often ask, doctor, how am I going to do? And I try to be as honest and transparent as I can in answering this question. And I'll often say something like, well, the good news is that the medications we have today do a pretty good job improving or controlling slow and small movement and stiffness for about five years or so, although the response to tremor is really quite variable. And then in that time frame from five years through 10 years after diagnosis, many patients experience those motor or response fluctuations that Werner talked about, and some also develop dyskinesias, those involuntary twisting turning movements. And in that time frame, we're often adjusting medications, adding additional medications, and some patients need to go on to device-aided therapies like deep brain stimulation. But then 10 to 12 years and beyond from the time of diagnosis, that's when things begin to get really tough. Many patients experience cognitive decline or dementia and balance problems and gait disorders. And for these things, we don't really have good symptomatic treatments and it's gonna be very difficult to develop robust symptomatic treatments. And that's why I think it's so important to think about how can we slow progression of disease over time? And I often use that as an introduction to talk about patients participating in clinical trials to help evaluate uh, potential therapies. Next slide. But even as I say this to patients and I'm trying to be as honest as I can, I, I'm often wondering, is even that too rosy a description? And I'm gonna go through some data for you and uh, I guess you can form your own thoughts about this. Here is a classic study called the Sydney Multicenter Study. These investigators followed patients from diagnosis through 15 years. And first of all, regarding mortality, they saw that the standardized mortality ratio was 1.86 or 
uh, in other words, 86% increased mortality compared to uh, similar people without a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. The median time from onset of disease to death was just 12.2 years. The mean age of death was 75 years. Pneumonia was the most common cause of death with most of these patients having been bedridden at the time of death. Next slide. And when these investigators looked to see what these patients had experienced through 15 years, 96% had experienced motor fluctuations, 94% had developed dyskinesias, 84% had developed cognitive decline with 48% experiencing dementia, and 81% were experiencing falls. Next slide, please. And so in my description here, I'm gonna go back and start with sort of middle disease as you saw in Werner's slide. And as I mentioned, many of the patients here are experiencing motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. So it's important to understand that these motor fluctuations and dyskinesias increase over time as we treat patients. They are associated with decreased quality of life. And despite recent advances in the introduction of new therapies, they do remain an unmet treatment need. Next slide, please. And so I just put in this slide some of our more recent therapies, right? TARA, which is extended release carbidopa levodopa, DUOPA, which is a delivery of uh, carbidopa levodopa into the enteric nervous system, delivery right into the gut via a pump and tube, and deep brain stimulation. And here's what happened in the pivotal trials when we looked just at that treatment arm. Patients come into these trials with about six hours of off time or time when their current medication regimen is not providing good benefit. And so all of these uh, therapies provided benefit that allowed these uh, therapies to be approved. But I want you to look at the residual off time. Uh, they went from six hours down to, in the case of Ritari, 3.9 hours of residual off time, Duopa, 2.3 hours of residual off time, and DBS, 3.4 hours of residual off time. So although we've improved the situation, patients still have off time and we haven't solved that problem. Next slide. And similarly for dyskinesia, so far the best therapy and really the only approved therapy we have for dyskinesia is amantadine. Recovery is the brand name for extended release uh, amantadine. And here is a data from the pivotal trial for amantadine. Patients came into that trial with 9.4 hours of dyskinesia and in the GoCovery group, we were able to reduce that to 5.3 hours. Again, this is part of the basis for the approval of GoCovery. We did improve the situation, but they're still left with 5.3 hours of dyskinesia. So we still have a ways to go to uh, really eliminate this problem. Next slide, please. And now thinking about a little bit further out in disease, falls become more common. They're associated with decreased quality of life. They increase in likelihood over the course of Parkinson's disease up until the time where patients are at such risk that they're really no longer put themselves at risk because they're either wheelchair bound or bed bound. Falls are due to multiple causes, including balance impairment, freezing, festinating gait, lightheadedness or orthostatic hypotension, and cognitive decline, as well as attention deficits. Next slide, please. And so how common are falls? Well, Parkinson's dis disease has been described as a disease of falling. And in this meta-analysis, these investigators identified that the three-month fall rate for individuals with Parkinson's disease was 46%, really striking. They identified that the best predictor of falling was two or more falls in the previous year. But even in subjects without prior falls, the fall rate was 21% and they identified that injuries were common and occurred in about a quarter of subjects. Next slide, please. In another study where patients were identified at baseline and then followed through four years and eight years, when they looked at non-fallers at baseline, the rate of new fallers at four years was 38% and at eight years was 68%. So you can see this increase over time. And when you looked at patients who were evaluated at each of those visits, the prevalence of falls went from 27% at baseline to 38% at four years and 72% after eight years. So again, you see this drastic increase in the problem of falls over time. Next slide, please. What about dementia and Parkinson's disease? It's associated with reduced quality of life, 
shortened survival, increased caregiver distress. And when one looks at point prevalence in the community, it's been estimated to be between 28 and 44%. Next slide. And in the best study, look at prevalent, looking at prevalence of dementia over time, this comes from Arslan. They found that dementia rates increased by 26% every four years uh, when patients were followed longitudinally. So this is another big problem over time in Parkinson's patients. Next slide, please. And we're gonna mention non-motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms have gained uh, increasing attention over the last uh, five to 10 years or so. And so what happens when you look at Parkinson's disease patients who are in a nursing home, uh, these investigators found that for those patients, quality of life was poor and it was largely correlated to the presence and severity of non-motor symptoms. Each resident endorsed an average of 13 non-motor symptoms. Autonomic, autonomic problems were highly prevalent, including urinary urgency, nocturia, constipation. Depression was present in 45%. Sleep problems were highly common. And uh, dementia was uh, present in between 56 and 77%. Next slide. So I've described the problems of middle disease and late disease, and now I'm just gonna to turn to earlier disease, uh, sometimes referred to as the honeymoon period. And I just wanna comment that the honeymoon may not be such a great honeymoon if you look at it a little more closely. And in this particular study, these investigators looked at non-motor symptoms over time. And in the population of patients, they looked at the beginning at time of diagnosis and two years and four years. And what they saw was that the prevalence of non-motor symptoms as well as the severity increased over time. And the non-motor symptoms increasing the most from two years to four years included swallowing problems, nausea and vomiting, nocturia, hallucinations, sex drive, dizziness, daytime sleepiness, and restless leg syndrome. Next slide. And they also saw the quality of life worsened with regard to the domain of bodily discomfort going from two years to four years. And this was associated both with worsening of motor features as well as non-motor features, although it correlated more strongly with non-motor features. Next slide. So hopefully I've detailed some of the problems that occur as Parkinson's disease progresses. And it really is a devastating disease over time. And I hope then you can see that it's critical that we try to identify the diagnosis as early as possible and then apply disease modifying treatments to delay the onset of these problems and decrease the severity and impact of these problems over time. And I think with that, I'll throw it back to uh, Milton. So thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Bob, and I appreciate everybody's involvement. So if you just look at the summary of the experts we've brought forward today, um, we started with Werner's description of the disease itself, how it evolves, the primary symptomology, moved on to what Inhibicase is doing, both in, from the mechanistic point of view, where we've been involved in primary discovery of the biochemistry of the disease, along with many of our colleagues in academia. Uh, and then with Warren's discussion of our clinical trial e efforts and outcomes to date, which have moved very fast, very quickly over time. We started in the clinic with no patients dosed in February of 2021. We are imminently going to be starting our phase 2A program, the three-month study that Warren described uh, in the coming few weeks, two or three weeks approximately. And then we learned from Bob all of the challenges associated with that process. So I now wanna bring us the opportunity to um, uh, have the panel brought forward uh, and have an extended answer and, uh, question and answer session. Um, Alex, do you want to bring forward some of the questions that we may have seen in the, in the chat to date? Great. Thank you, Milton. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, uh, you may submit it through the chat box below uh, the video player. We will pause momentarily to compile all the questions. The first question is, could you please walk us through the time scale of disease progression from when GI issues are observed to when getting diagnosed with PD? Um, Werner or, or uh, Bob, would you like to answer that, or both of you? I'm I'm happy to to make a start. This is a very good question, since we now know about this prodromal period of Parkinson's, where pathology in the nervous system, not only the brain, maybe outside the brain, uh, as a start, is ongoing. People have not developed the symptoms that 
allow for a clinical diagnosis by current criteria, but they have unspecific problems like loss of smell, constipation, they may have depression, they may have this strange uh, disorder of sleep where they are acting out their dreams because they have lost the um, ability to switch off muscle activity during dreaming. Uh, all these prom prodromal things occur up to 10 years or more before the motor symptoms start. We know, for example, from RBD, this uh, condition where people are acting out their dreams, um, when you follow such patients who are otherwise healthy, have no problems other than, than that, they may not even notice the sleep problem, their spouses or their bed partners will, uh, and you follow them for 20 years, they still, after 10 years, may still convert into Parkinson's disease. So this prodromal period, this window of opportunity for treatments that might not only stop the progression of clinical disease, but may even in the end of the day prevent it, may be a very long window of opportunity. The, the challenge here is to find good markers that are really very, very reliable indicators that someone is in this prodromal period where pathology of the kind that uh, Middleton and Warren have outlined, uh, it's a nuclear pathology, is ongoing, but not yet causing these classical symptoms. Bob? Yeah, I agree with everything Warren has said. I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the challenge here. Um, there's a lot of interest in trying to identify patients with prodromal Parkinson's disease who have some uh, of these symptoms or, or one uh, or combination of these symptoms and look to see if we can delay the motor onset of Parkinson's disease. And I think we can do that things get tricky to try and screen enough patients and be able to treat them long enough that enough patients convert over to motor Parkinson's disease in the untreated group, uh, but not in the active treated group. So that's a bit of a challenge. And then as we think about moving earlier and earlier, we begin to get into a challenge of, well, what's the endpoint that we're looking at? Can we just look at what happens to GI function uh, based on Parkinson's disease pathology as we move early and earlier and away from motor uh, onset. So I'll just leave it as a comment there. Me, uh, uh, go ahead, Warren. Can, can I make just an additional comment, uh, which is a little bit peripheral, but it leads directly to that question. We did a study and it was interesting that it hadn't really been looked at before in which we examined the brains of uh, a large number of Parkinson patients ranging from time of diagnosis to 27 years after diagnosis with all the different times in between. And what we discovered is that by three to four years after diagnosis, there were no more dopamine terminals left in the striatum, none. And the reason that's important is if you have a neuroprotective therapy and the terminals are gone, there's nothing to protect. So it becomes critically important to begin to think uh, along the lines that Warner and Bob are, are describing. Can we des describe the disease earlier? Can we find clinical trial methods that allow us to recognize when something is working, if you're blocking it? But really, if you wait too late to introduce a disease-modifying therapy, you may be in a position where there are no more nerves left to protect. And that's why you're seeing trials moving earlier and earlier. Yeah, I think that very much reflects the discussion we've had internally on um, looking at patients with formal diagnosis of disease. So we can look at a variety of functional parameters that are deteriorating over time, but not so functionally deteriorated that we cannot, you know, really see evidence of protective responses. Um, I have one, you know, I'm curious, as you know, uh, both Warner and Bob, we've, there's been a lot of discussion about this gut first versus brain first phenomena because of the work that we did in drug treatment and Ted and Melina Dawson, along with Jay Patricia did in um, just looking at gut introduction of synuclein aggregates to drive the disease formation in the brain. Um, where is your current thinking about this? I think the GI, as we've treated it, is an important component of measurement and a disease manifestation, but really haven't tried to answer this other question. Could the disease really begin in the gut? Um, any opinions about that? Bob, do you want to make a start? Or... Sure, sure. I'll go. I'll go ahead and start. 
Um, well, I, I think uh, in answering the last question, we, we talked about the fact that GI issues, especially constipation, are certainly a risk factor for the development of classic motor Parkinson's disease. Uh, you mentioned the, the uh, clinical trials showing you can uh, seed synuclein into the gut of animal models and you can recapitulate what uh, looks like a, a decent model of, of Parkinson's disease. Um, so to me, it looks like gut to brain uh, is a very reasonable model. And then the question is, how about brain to gut? And uh, in my mind, that's a little low, less well established, but there are investigators who've worked on uh, imaging uh, studies and clusters of uh, symptoms. And they have suggested that they can divide Parkinson's disease into these two kinds of categories based on both uh, imaging and uh, symptom clusters and have suggested these two things. So I have an open mind. Uh, I think I'm excited about gut to brain because I think that leaves a lot more opportunity for identification, for biomarkers, for treatment, but uh, I'm leaving open this notion of can potentially start in the brain as well. Gordon? Yeah, I, I agree to that. And uh, what Bob was alluding to this hypothesis of having these two trajectories of body first, which would be gut and traveling upwards of pathology to finally reach the brain versus brain first, starting maybe in the olfactory system. Um, that's intriguing. I think in the end of the day, when we are using these treatments that are targeting the pathology of synuclein aggregation and propagation, uh, like we discussed today, the Siebel uh, drug, for example, uh, it will the critical thing will be to be absolutely sure we're in this early phase and to have a good biomarker, whether that's imaging, like our colleagues who, who did this body first, brain first, uh, are suggesting would it be uh, tissue, like you know, gut biopsies versus colonic biopsies, would it be skin biopsies, would it be, we've been interested in nasal swabs even to get the olfactory neurons uh, as a potential starting point. We need to I'd be able to really securely identify these individuals who are en route, en route to develop Parkinson's, regardless whether they're en route from their gut, whether they're en route from their nose, uh, but they're going to get it and we want them to either not get it at all or to get it at a later point in time as late as possible. All right. Alex, why don't we take the next question? Just, just before you do. I, I I, th I think there's a, a really important point here. And when we first started suggesting that alpha synuclein was a prion and that Parkinson's might be a prion disorder, uh, we, we actually thought that it could start anywhere and that it was very unlikely that it was all coming from the same place, that some could be genetic, some could be due to toxins, some could be due to infection, and probably the vast majority were stochastic, which means they're occurring randomly. And some could be starting in the gut coming up, some could be starting in the nose. And the reason I mention that is it shows the problem with trying to pick one point as the pre-signal that you can rely on, especially with something as common as, as constipation or GI problems, which of course can occur with a whole bunch of other conditions. They don't have to be related to Parkinson's disease. And from a regulatory point of view, one of the things we're now doing is similar to the headache situation, where if you're gonna go after non-motor features as a major endpoint, what you can do is define what is the major non-motor endpoint for that person. And in the same study, you can see deterioration in different endpoints as being the major uh, endpoint for that particular trial. Same as in headache, uh, if you have migraine and for one patient it's nausea vomiting, for another patient it's uh, uh, some, uh, you know, hallucinate or uh, uh, aura, et cetera. So I think that's very important because it shows the complexity of trying to do these uh, studies uh, and, and of course, from an, an inhibit case point of view, it shows the advantage that regardless of where it's starting, interfering with CABLE would in theory be helpful. Yeah, systemic treatment, I think, has not been the current industry focus. We've only viewed it as that as the way to go forward. I think very few companies have, you know, recognized that uh, until the recent data that we and others have generated. Uh, Alex, could you go ahead with the next question? Great. 
Could you describe the physical state of the patients with MMSE greater than 28 in the dose escalation phase versus MMSE greater than 26 at enrollment in later phases? You mean, I guess it's referring to our phase two trials. So, you know, the, the cognitive, so the MMSE has a zero to 30 scale. Uh, of course, your experts can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so typically we've enrolled at an MMSC of 28 or greater. These are people who have no cognitive decline. Um, for the phase two trials, we relaxed that a little bit to 26. Uh, there isn't a significant difference. And Warren, you can correct me if I'm mis misquoting this. I don't think there's a significant difference for these patients. The problem is that early in Parkinson's disease, as both Bob and Warner have, have shown in the evolution of the disease, you do get some mild cognitive impairment, and we wanted to make sure and capture people who might have some mild cognitive impairment and not exclude them from enrollment. Uh, would you agree that's a, a proper description, Warren? I, I think that's fair. The other thing is, I, I agree with you, 2628 is basically uh, similar. Uh, it's, it's different in Alzheimer's disease than Parkinson's because uh, to me, a, a, an MMSE in a Parkinson patient of 26, where they tend to get more executive function disorder, is actually more intimidating or worse than it is, say, in a Parkinson patient, in an Alzheimer patient, where they're often much lower. Um, the main reason we have a limit on it is we want patients who are accurate and can follow the instructions and can report in a way that we can rely on what they're saying, especially with the agency now focusing so much on patient-related outcomes as what they want as the primary outcome. So if you have a patient that's too cognitively impaired, uh, that will impair your study. You'll get more oh, the measuring. Yeah. The variability, right. Uh, next question, Alex. What initial disease modifying effects would you consider as key ones to watch for in these dose escalation and expansion in the expansion phase? Well, that's a very good question. So in the animal studies, of course, we see a broad based disease modification. Um, but of course, the advantage of animals is you can take them apart and really quantify what that means. You can count neurons, et cetera. Here, we're looking at patient reported outcomes for most of the higher order CNN central nervous system functions. In the GI, we have much more quantitative measures for both upper and lower GI function, which use standard diagnostics. And so the advantage of including the GI in an evaluation regimen is that those improvements are based on more uh, accepted norms for GI recovery, regardless of the mechanism of that recovery. In the brain, these are more indirect aspects. And I think uh, Warren and, and Warner, you can probably both comment on this. Well, I, I, Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment. Uh, you know, I think we have a, a mismatch between what, what Warren touched on for regulatory and what we can, what, what we see in patients and what makes the most sense. So I'll say what makes the most sense off the bat is that patients deteriorate in an untreated state motorically. And that's where we might expect to see the most change. So if we were just looking for the most sensitive measure, I think to see a change in motor decline would make a lot of sense. And GI as well makes a lot of sense. But I think uh, regulatory will come in and say, well, wait a minute, uh, in early disease, we've got levodopa, that does a pretty good job for motor. And we've got plenty of treatments for constipation. Um, this, this isn't really a good, good way to go about it. We don't, we don't really want to give an approval based on that. So the way I think about it is I think that these are signals of disease modification. Mm -hmm. And the way I've looked at it is, is I think the approach is you do your study in early disease, concentrating on motor, and you can pick your non-motor, whether you want to look at a vast array or you want to concentrate on GI or both. You get your signal in early disease, but then I think it's incumbent on us to prove that we're doing what we're trying to do, which is to prevent this long-term accumulation of big, bad disability that includes things like cognitive decline and balance and falls and accumulation of a lot of disability related to non-motor stuff. So I think it's really a two-stage process that we're going to end up doing and that we should do. So Bob, I, I think you gave a brilliant answer and, and, and I think that was great, but let's go back to terra firma. Uh, we have run long-term simple studies. You were involved, I think, in some of the ones we did uh, through the National Institutes of Health. 
very few companies want to run a five or 10 year clinical trial. They'll run out of patent life before they ever uh, get a drug approved. And if you're going to do a clinical trial, you have to have an endpoint that the agency is willing to accept as a meaningful endpoint. I totally agree with what you said. But if we were to make GI a primary endpoint, I know I got a fight on my hands with the agency to try and convince them to accept that it has anything to do because they will argue there's so many other factors. And as you said, there's so many other treatments. So I think that that's why we wrote the paper and I encourage your audience to read that paper because it goes into these kinds of details. I think we need to pick an endpoint that the agency will agree to at least give us approval and, and, and we can get an approval in a relatively short period of time, which is important. And at the same time, we can be looking for other things and hopefully even in hierarchical order. So if we did see GI impairment or change in cognition or change in falls, we could incorporate it into the label. And that would really help us in terms of the marketplace because other drugs can't do that. We don't have a drug that stops falling. And I think these are the things we need to think of. So I totally agree with you, but when you're designing a study for practical purposes, you have to think in terms of what the regulatory agencies are going to be willing to accept. I, I don't disagree. I'll just say a lot of those who've gone in early still end up doing a five-year study and end up not gaining anything from it. That, that's my point. Well, but, but again, yeah. Bob, we're trying to develop a new therapy here. I don't know what it will do. We don't have any drugs that are proven to be disease modifying. So I don't know what would be in five years. And, you know, it's much easier to convince uh, Milton and a company like his to do a long-term study if they have an approval and they do it as a phase four. Just do it in the post-market. And I think that's what you'll end up doing. I don't have a problem with that. I think that'd be great. Because There's no question that's a burden that we'll face. There's no way to define disease modification from a regulatory perspective now. And we don't necessarily need that. If we are able to show primary benefit using a hierarchy of endpoints that we've described, and you keep following these patients and they simply don't progress, at some point you'll be able to make the argument that says, well, they're not progressing and it's been a while. We should be modifying the disease. There's no other way to conclude that, right? I, I think we're saying the same thing. The only difference you're saying is you think you can get the agency to, to give an approval based on the description in early disease. I think that'd be fantastic if we could get that. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that's important is to appreciate that even if you get long-term benefits, if you don't have an indication and it's not in your label, you can't talk about it. Uh, you can publish it in, a, in an article, but from a company point of view, you would like the world to know and you'd like to market it. That's why you really need to think about getting it into the label, either as an indication or into section 12 or 14. I think I, I, I kind of liked Bob's statement on the sensitivity of the motor outcomes, you know, in this kind of population you're targeting with your program. Uh, I, I think you're wise, though, in, in, in planning to have the part two that you had on your slide as well. So you have some sort of handle on the non-motor issues. We've, we've discussed a lot on the sensitivity of the part two and, and the part three. Um, and a number of, of, of uh, efforts that are ongoing in Europe, at least, they, they're still trying to take the two, both of them, as you, as you were suggesting. Um, but um, clearly what Bob said, uh, I can, you know, I can only agree, it's, it's a bit of a dilemma what we want to see in the end, and regulators would love to see, it, it requires a lot of time to see it. So you need to, you need to go somewhere where you can get it, your signal earlier. But how you structure it is critically important, Warner, because remember, one of the problems is we don't have a drug. We don't have a pathway. We don't have natural history. We, I mean, you presented some, Bob, and I, I, we've done studies that I think you and I were involved together in the Adagio extension, which showed the same kind of data. Um, I totally agree. But the problem is if we make cognitive change or we make falling the primary endpoint, the chances of failure are going to be much higher than if we make motor the primary endpoint. That, and that you would argue, well, you can't distinguish. Well, the way I would approach it is you make motor the primary endpoint because you've got a better chance of getting an indication. And then you incorporate into the design falling and cognition so that if you do hit, you can include it into the label because you've designed it correctly. But to me, it's very risky to say, cognitive impairment is what I'm going after with a disease modifying therapy, because you and I both know changing cognition can be very slow. Very slow. 
All right, next question, Alex. Great. This question is directed at Dr. Alano. Uh, could you talk to the functional outcomes measure included in the phase 1B study, motor and non-motor? Uh, what might we have learned from the cohorts that have already been completed and what might your expectations be from the ongoing and future cohorts? The, the agency has made it clear that, for instance, in the new MDS UPD arrests, they like uh, part two. So if you can use ADL part two and show a benefit, uh, they want that. We have thought in the past ADL part two doesn't move very much, which is why we have focused on part three. But we've just done some studies recently, and actually part two moves quite well. So I think it's wise to incorporate ADL part two. Other kinds of things you could incorporate could be what we call the CGI or the clinical global impression of improvement. And there are methods of analysis to show that patient and physician rating of benefit, either change or, or, or severity, uh, uh, are, are, are benefited with a given treatment. And they've accepted that. They like that. There are quality of life measures, which are not so widely accepted, but could support your case. So we've included uh, quality of uh, life measures. Um, and the other thing that the agency has recently liked that I like as well is, is, is if we do um, responder analyses. They like responder analyses where if you have, for instance, the number of patients that deteriorate by eight points or the number of people that die or something like that, and you can show your responder rate is better than another. They, they like that as potentially a functional meaning improvement. I can tell you that Michael J. Fox and others are very actively pursuing these uh, PROs, as we call them, patient reported outcomes, to try and find those that are sensitive and can be used in early disease. That's a very important issue. Well, let me just comment. I think the questioner was also wondering about specific outcomes in the inhibit case phase 1B. That trial is still ongoing. It's blinded. Uh, and while we've, what we've made, said publicly is we see some trends in some uh, measures, we really are not not interpreting those trends while the trial is ongoing. And it's a short dosing duration with just six people of eight total in a, each dosing cohort on drugs. So it's very difficult to make interpretations from that. There will be a point in the future when that trial concludes that we'll have something to say about the observations that have been made. Alex? Perfect. This next question is directed at Dr. Hauser. How might you see inhibit cases work in PD inform what the company could do in other neurodegenerative diseases, um, for example, dementias? Uh, how might a development path look like uh, in the future? And what proof of concept would you like to see uh, ongoing uh, in, the, in, in the phase one, two work uh, that would give you incremental confidence? Yeah. Okay. So that's a tough one for me because I'm a movement disorder doc. <clears throat> so well, all I can say is, you know, I'm familiar with their work related to synuclein and uh, the other disorder that I can speak to a little bit is, is MSA. So MSA is another synucleinopathy. It's a progressive disorder uh, that actually disability accumulates more rapidly. Um, it responds poorly to levodopa and other treatments patients uh, experience autonomic dysfunction and falls uh, in just a few years. And it's a very, very bad disease. <clears throat> so um, that's another target for their uh, therapy. And uh, I, to my knowledge, I know they're working in animal models uh, related to MSA. I don't know what they've released publicly. I see Warren sitting up on his seat. So maybe he wants to say something about that. But I would think MSA would be a great target. And uh, I know that they're exploring that. That's all I can say. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly comment what we said in the past um, uh, with Jeff Cordaris group. Jeff's one of the leading um, basic research scientists of Parkinson's disease worldwide. And Jeff and I published uh, a small paper in neurobiology disease at the, in early 2021, demonstrating that there is clear evidence in postmortem samples from patient brain of MSA that able activation and able modification of the synuclein aggregates in that disease have an effect, are, are observed. Then we saw the same thing in Jeff's animal models of MSA, both in uh, rodent and in non-human primate. And we have two active um, efforts in rodent ongoing to look at the therapeutic benefit of IKT-1409 and MSA. If we see evidence of a functional benefit, and one of those outcomes uh, I think we'll see 
in the coming couple of weeks, or, or at least in the next month, because we know that they're at that stage of the analysis. Um, that will uh, gate whether we continue what we've begun to do is to set up a phase two trial as a relatively small exploratory trial, similar to the phase two in Parkinson's in MSA patients. Um, you know, from the inhibicase perspective, it's known that ABLE is activated and might play a role in models of a animal models of ALS, which are not that good in many animal models of Alzheimer's disease, where you see ABLE inhibitors being anti-amyloid and anti-tau in Alzheimer's disease. So we really think that there are many opportunities to have a broader impact on neurogenerative diseases as a company. Uh, obviously, because of our knowledge and the quality of models that have been developed uh, in Parkinson's disease, we think that's gonna be the best place to first see this correlation between animal model outcomes and human response. And if that connectivity is made, that's gonna open the gate to many other uh, riskier opportunities with less well-established models uh, to look at other neurodegenerative diseases. Alex? Great, Milton, this next question is directed at you. Uh, with regards to C-ABLE activation, uh, the goal is stated is the reduction of the internal uh, alpha-synuclein aggregates, uh, but alpha-synuclein oligomers uh, binding to the synapse outside of the cell are also thought to be potentially detrimental to patients. Um, in, in essence, uh, could you describe C. Abel's role in synaptic binding or external influences? Well, there's a couple of different places that we know of based on recent studies. So uh, one is the movement of synuclein aggregates between affected neurons. We believe, although it's not fully, it's not a full agreement in the academic community about this, that the pathological synuclein is moving between neurons through direct contact, uh, so-called actin nanotubes which form in an able dependent manner. We know this from a variety of studies we've done in the past in different therapeutic areas. Um, we've had no studies to date done to look at external synuclein aggregates and what their state is. Uh, from a clinical perspective, even antibodies that can sequester synuclein aggregates um, in the brain have not seemed to have an effect either on disease progression or on any functional benefits. So. Um, at the moment, we don't think there is a significant disease component that is accessible to ABLE inhibition that's related to external synuclein aggregates that could interfere with synaptic transmission. That remains um, a paradox. We know that there are effects, in, obviously, in dopamine transport. The question is, is it due to the external synuclein aggregates that people have often thought are associating with the presynaptic bouton, or whether it's really a biochemical effect internal to the, to the neurons due to the presence of the aggregates for which we only know a portion of the overall biochemical effect they have on the function of the neuron. And those are open questions we can't answer yet. Next question. Uh, next question is, are there any plasma, CSF, or microbiome uh, biomarkers for phosphorylated uh, alpha-synucleins such as exosomes or cellular debris that might be useful? Um, you know, I can certainly start with that question. Uh, it's something we've obviously explored. So one of the aspects of the disease that has remained controversial is, is any synuclein aggregate disease associated or is it only the chemically modified forms? Um, in work that we have published and also um, tentatively in the Dawson have published in, in, in multitude in the last couple of years, the evidence suggests it's the tissue deposited synuclein aggregates that are driving the disease state, not the soluble aggregates that precede them. So if that proves to be the case in human disease, then um, looking at CSF um, uh, synuclein aggregates, which we ourselves are going to do, may not be as informative. The ideal case would be to either do brain biopsy or to do biopsy in another tissue which is known to be affected in disease, such as in the GI. The problem with the brain, of course, is that we cannot do brain biopsy in living patients, that there's no ethical basis for doing that, especially since the sampling would have to be done near the brain stem, which would be incredibly invasive. Nobody would ever volunteer. Um, the GI offers an opportunity. There have been efforts at looking at GI biopsy in the past that have been unsuccessful. We know the synuclein aggregates distribute relatively uniformly across the gut, but we have a problem when we consider GI biopsy, and that is that the synuclein aggregates, at least in animal studies, uh, end up in an area that's about mid-wall thickness in the colon. 
And the only way to get access to the tissue there is to do a perforation biopsy. So that's to punch all the way through the tissue. In elderly patients where you might do this with an endoscope, similar to what you'd use in colonoscopy, that comes with a bleeding risk. And, and we don't know for sure where the synuclein aggregates are in humans. We, there is no natural history data behind it. So we're engaged in a process with Jay Patricia's lab, an expert in the neuroanatomy of the gut, looking at the time course of development of synuclein aggregates and how it distributes along the GI tract from mouth to anus and a rodent. And we'll see whether that can help us inform where sampling might be tried in an exploratory basis in the future. That's one of the reasons why we and a company known as CND and Roche have pursued skin biopsy as a potential way at looking that. It's known that synuclein aggregates um, collect in peripheral nervous tissue in the skin. The rate of, def of uh, deposition of those aggregates in the skin is unknown. Uh, are they reflective of the human disease progression? Also unknown. So, um, but with a systemic treatment like an ABLE inhibitor that has seemed to drive clearance in living organisms, uh, it may be a way of looking for pathology clearance systemically in the body. And that's why it's being pursued. Uh, we're using it as an exploratory measure in our phase two trials. I don't know if uh, of our expert panel has other comments to make about this, which is the holy grail. So if you could know where the synuclein pathology is and you could monitor it, you would be able to, you know, parallel what's been done in other neurodegenerative diseases that the FDA seems to be very attracted to. The FDA is attracted to it, but it's far from proven. And there's a lot of criticism about the FDA for the way they've been attracted to it Great. without being established. Um, I'll just briefly say, I, I agree with you, what you said. To me, there's still some debate because I think there's still some debate that some of the aggregates could actually be protective. And the way I think of it is that C. able is inducing toxic or, uh, or or at least the toxic species of alpha synuclein and that's the real issue and that's what you're blocking and whether it's in an aggregate or whether it's in a, 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 a you know a fibrillar form to me is 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 less uh, critical the problem we've had is when we try and look for alpha synuclein as a marker in plasma, CSF, the results have been extremely variable and nothing consistent has really shown up. Uh, Fox has run this huge PPMI study and so far that has not yielded benefit. I told you before that I think that the problem could start anywhere and you are seeing people, there's been reports of increased alpha synuclein in skin, in gut, in salivary glands, in nasal filaments, all over, but it may not be in every patient. So when you take a patient in, you don't know where it's going to be. And the other problem you face is, is it's not everywhere. So you could take a biopsy and see alpha synuclein in one place and in another place, it may not be there in the same individual at the same time. So as logical as it is, and as much as we desperately would like to know, and hopefully alpha synuclein imaging will help to inform this situation. Right now, it, to me, it remains exploratory, worth doing, but exploratory. I agree to that, what you're saying, Warren. The, the big, we've, we've been interested recently in the seeding activity, seeding aggregation assays using the olfactory mucosa of the nose because it's so non-invasively accessible and it's basically nerve cells. Um, but with, as with all the other tissue we've mentioned, skin, gut, the, these assays have not yet been shown to be sensitive to change over time. And that's really what we would like to see with a treatment like a C-ABLE inhibitor. Would it, would it slow this kind of pathology progression. And that's why I agree when you say the imaging, you know, the, it would be fantastic if we had some progress there in synuclein imaging, like was presented recently in this, in the, in the Barcelona meeting. If, if that were, you know, substantiating itself uh, would be a big step forward. Bob, any comments? Yeah, um, it, it'd be great if we could image the right thing. I mean, this parallels what uh, Warren was saying. Um, you know, uh, I think they presented imaging of synuclea and they were able to show that they could uh, identify MSA versus healthy controls. Um, so it's just very nascent field. And even if we can uh, I see synuclea in Parkinson's disease and see change over time, 
are we really looking at the right synuclein, especially when it comes to C. able treatment? Um, it may not be synuclein, it may be the activated synuclein. So we really need to know what we're, what we're imaging. Yeah, I mean, certainly from the inhibicase perspective, we believe that the phosphorylated synuclein is the, is the object to monitor. And, uh, and that the aggregates that precede phosphorylation are not, not as likely to be disease causing, but right. not everyone agrees with our viewpoint. But um, even and, there, even and, there, Milton, it's phosphorylation at the tyrosine residue, not at the serine residue, which is what well, everyone's imaged so far. Let me um, clarify that. So we know from work we did with Ted and Melina Dawson that uh, tyrosine phosphorylation and serine phosphorylation occur in a concerted fashion. When you block ABLE by genetic deletion or chemical inhibition, you lose both marks. So we view phosphorylation as a marker of the pathological species. We think the modifications, and there may be more that are, that are present that we have not yet discovered, are concerted. And so um, we've, at least for the moment, come to the conclusion that um, monitoring either phosphorylated form is likely to be monitoring the most likely pathological species. We haven't seen any evidence yet in animal studies of serine phosphorylation in the absence of tyrosine phosphorylation or vice versa. But that's still premature to, to conclude. And there certainly could be. The biggest problem you have with this is that the phosphorylated synuclein is insoluble in most organic solvents. You can't extract it. It's not soluble in SDS, so you can't even denature it. So the, 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 the sophisticated mass spectrometry methods we have for identifying sites of chemical modification just fail because we've got no way to put it into a solution to flow it and measure it. It's really challenging. So, uh, but those so solutions will be found now that we, we have a better idea of what we're looking for. Uh, next question, Alex. And I'll remind everybody, we've got about 10 minutes left. Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, could you touch on the potential challenges with LRRK2 inhibitors? Or two inhibitors, who would like to take that question? Why, what do you mean by potential challenges? I, I mean, we're desperate to have a disease modifying therapy. Um, uh, we're working to help and support the company, but our main goal is to help patients. And if LARC2 inhibitors uh, help patients, we would jump for joy. And we think it's critical that all the different approaches using LARC2 inhibitors, using GBA enhancers, using immune approaches, all of them deserve to be studied. But eventually, you have to pays your money and takes your choice. And if you can interfere with the development of the toxic species, to me, that's where I want to be. Also, whether the LARC2 will be effective in patients who don't have the LARC2 mutation, remain, whether it will be effective in people who do have it needs to be proven. And if it is, will it be beneficial for all patients? Whereas the inhibicase molecule theoretically should prevent activation of toxic species and prevention of uh, uh, the, the uh, Parkin inhibition. Uh, and that should be an all comer. So if, if I had to make a choice, I like this model, but uh, I think all these companies need to go forward full blast because we don't have any yet that have been proven. And we're just speculating based on what we know. And as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, um, we'll take anything. <laughs> if, we, if we knew for sure, we would have done it previously. <laughs> but one of the challenges, maybe one could say with the LARC2, uh, practical, it's, it's, a, it's a mere pragmatic thing, is that not every, the, depending on where you are in which ethnicity, in which region of the world you want to do your trials, uh, it may be difficult to recruit and find these LARC2 patients. I, I'm not saying Austria is the most important country in the world. We're, we're a small country, but we, we, we don't have any, for some reason, LARC2 patients in our country. But of course, I know there are areas in the world where the is more prevalent. Yeah, I mean, LARC2, the mutations that are that where you see a high prevalence of disease has been in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. So those are the populations you're going to see that in. And, uh, you know, LARC2, I mean, there have been reports recently that I'm sure all of you can better speak to than myself that suggest that the LARC2 patients, although they're early onset because LARC2 seems to be linked to uh, vesicular trafficking and to, and to exosome transport. And so that might explain why you get earlier spread and earlier manifestation of disease. 
otherwise clinically those patients aren't really distinguishable from sporadic disease. And if that's the case, the underlying phenomena that you have to deal with, and in the Nehiva case view, we think that's important, is dealing with you know, the consequences of the disease and synuclein pathology. LARC2 just makes it more complicated, not less, I think. It, it gets even more than that because people with LARC2 mutations don't have complete expression. A lot of people carry it and never develop Parkinson's disease. Patients have been described with LARC2 who develop ALS, who develop uh, a motor neuron disease. Uh, there's so much about LARC2 mutation we don't understand. Uh, again, I emphasize, I think studying LARC2 inhibitors is important. And also LARC2 inhibitors may turn out to be uh, beneficial in sporadic PD for all we know. I mean, there are reasons to argue that it facilitates uh, alpha-synuclein uh, misfolding and toxicity. But um, you, you know, there's only so many studies you can do. And for a company like Inhibicase, uh, they can't do everything. So I think they've picked one that, at least from my perspective and the studies we've done, is one of the most exciting, most promising, say that. Next question, Alex. Great. Uh, seeing a lot of these, so I'm going to group them all together. Uh, can you highlight uh, in every case expected milestones over the next 12 months, uh, including when you expect to begin dosing uh, the phase two study for 14809, um, as well as uh, updates on the preclinical pipeline? Sure. So, you know, we can speak to this to the extent we've made that public in our recent 10K. Uh, we are, we now have um, uh, more than 10 sites. Um, completing their contracting process, almost ready to uh, begin enrolling patients. We have another 22 sites that are getting to that stage. So in just three months this year, we've had a lot of success in getting the uh, sites identified and moved into the full process that's required in order to begin um, enrolling patients. So we expect in the next few weeks to have our first patient in in the phase 2A study. Uh, that's going to occur 14 or 15 months from having done no clinical measures whatsoever. So we've moved pretty efficiently. Um, because that study is going to be enrolling patients that uh, have a formal diagnosis of Parkinson's, that'll be evaluated by an expert group through an enrollment authorization committee, which we've made public, um, to ensure that we have properly diagnosed patients in the trial. Um, that study will accumulate a half to one patient per center per month. And with 30 to 40 sites, you know, we could predict six or eight months to enroll. It's gonna be on a rolling basis with three months of dosing and we don't measure a recovery period in those studies. So somewhere between nine and 12 months, we'll begin to start reporting outcomes there depending on how that transpires. I think in the coming year, as Warren already outlined, uh, we're well on the process of both designing and now formalizing a protocol for a phase 2B3 study which would be designed as a registrational trial with proper power. Uh, it'll have some flexibility because as we learn from the 2A three-month study, we'll um, may modify the hierarchy of measurements for the primary endpoints in that study and, uh, and where the dosing may um, end up going. I think from the uh, additional pipeline elements for us, uh, as we've stated previously, if we continue to see, if we see positive benefit functionally from therapeutic administration, of 14809 in the MSA animal models. We'll, we were already doing at risk the setup of a phase 2A study uh, in 60 patients in MSA in sites in Europe and the US, mostly in the EU and four EU countries, uh, where a clinical trial network was previously established. And, uh, and then we expect to have the OM Pro program, the ProDrug program, uh, coming into the clinic uh, possibly before the end of this quarter. Certainly, the IND will be filed in this quarter. Uh, really depends on uh, the completion of that process. We now just have a, a couple of stability tests, tests left to complete the IND. So uh, in terms of the preclinical programs, for example, with 1427 and PML, uh, or with studies in dementia with Lewy body, uh, those are moving uh, fairly slowly. I think they're, 1427 certainly has been well characterized for PML. Bringing PML to the clinic is a more challenging question because of the nature of that program essentially because it's designed as a companion therapeutic. It would be given to patients who are taking other primary therapies that face the risk of PML, and you're measuring the potential change in risk factors. It's a complicated trial to run. We are thinking through that process, but clearly it's not at the primary focus of the company today uh, as it moves forward. 
and the same thing is true with other programs. We're primarily focused with those other programs in developing secondary generation molecules that learn from what we've learned with 1409 and 1427. And we'll say hopefully more about that uh, closer to the end of the year when some molecules may be ready to advance into the clinic. Uh, I think that probably is uh, about the end of our discussion today. I don't know if there are any closing remarks from the panel. I do wanna thank everyone who participated today from the participants who asked questions and hopefully you found this was insightful, both in terms of learning about the disease, the regulatory challenges, and what Inhibicase itself is trying to do to address them and where, we've, where our accomplishments are and where they still remain to be. Uh, anything else from the panelists? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for participating and I, I hopefully everybody found it was a, an insightful discussion and, uh, and a good use of your time. Thank you all, bye-bye.